Okay, today I'm with Chris Snell, who's the champion uh, budgie breeder and also uh, the new president of the Budgie Regard Society. Welcome to Hades, Chris. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Um, where did all this start? How long ago? How do you become a champion? Well, it all started uh, on my 10th birthday. Uh, that's 16th of June, 1965. So I'm quite old now. Um, I was sitting in the back garden, Little Coach Road in Grimsby, and my dad, who kept uh, pet birds before that were my eldest brother, but was working you know, long hours in Scunthorpe on the still works building them. And I can remember him saying to me, son, what do you want for your birthday? Now, I was football mad and cricket mad. And in 1965, there was no other entertainment. We had a black and white TV with BBC One only. And I looked and I thought, dad, why can't we have some more budgies like we used to have? And he'd stopped working at Scunthorpe then. He had more time. And I think it was the birthday present for him as well. So we bought, and dad was a joiner. We bought some, bought some birds and he built some cages and we, we bought 12 birds out of an aviary in Laceby near Grimsby and we put them in some cages and they were pet birds. So that was my start. Wow. And, yeah. and, and so where did it go from there? Well, we quick, quickly realised um, we didn't know what we was talking about. Um, it was interesting, there was a we looked in some books, and now a cinnamon budgerigar has brown wings, it says. And we looked. I looked in an aviary, and I said, Dad, that yellow one over there must be a cinnamon. And he looked, and I said, I don't think so, son. So we looked, and I said, a cinnamon has brown wings. It was actually a lutina with creosote on it. <laughs> so we, we know, knew nothing about the colours. But then... We heard about some exhibition birds and a chap called Frank Pett in Cleethorpes. In fact, his nephew, now Dave Pett, is in the hobby as well. But anyway, we went to see these birds and instantly, I was only 10, I could see the difference. And instantly, I knew I wanted exhibition birds. So we bought some of his, we got some from a few other local people, and we were hooked, well and truly hooked onto the hobby. Yeah. So what, what was it? about exhibition birds that's different so for anybody who's, who's <coughs> listening to this who doesn't know how, how well uh, 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 the the pet birds they, they can be exhibition birds but this the, the normal birds in the pet shop are a lot smaller uh, they're from the the original birds what came over with professor john gould in 1840 that's when the first budgerigars were imported to europe uh, and into england and he brought some birds over um, and obviously in in australia uh, they they're all green all light green that's the original color that's my favorite color as well so they're they're small and the if you could see a a wild budgerigar in australia now compare it to an exhibition bird of quality the exhibition bird probably three times the size you know so that is in my st now that's that's the difference uh, and we have different we have hundreds and hundreds of colors now by selective breeding and i could see <clears throat> that's what i wanted to have exhibition birds and then there was on about showing and my dad made some show cages and we did our first show in 1966 and it was at the hospital no it wasn't the hospital one it was the um Findus or Bird's Eye, one of the Rosses, sorry, Ross Group, where Tesco in Cleethorpes is now, that was a field, and they used to have a gala on there. And we showed some birds as a junior, I was then, your juniors up to the age of 16, and I was only 11, just turned 11, and we won Best Junior Baby, the Cinnamon Grey Green Cock. And my dad came up to me and he says, We've won some, because it, I was. 10 oh. now i was limited what i could do and he looked at me he said oh we can't have this i'm helping you you'll have to show us a beginner with the big men you know with the with the men and the women the older people and i started off showing after that one show as a junior in the beginner section and i started to beat the um the beginners and novices 
which didn't go down too well with the local people, but they soon got used to it. And that's the, the hobby just went off like that. And in the 1967, 68 time, we, we went to a, a chap called Jack Fisher from Derby, who kept probably one of, that's probably the second best stud in, 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 in the United Kingdom behind the great man, Harry Bryan. Though we bought his birds from Harry Bryan. And we bought uh, two pair of birds for £80. 1968, a lot of money. Absolutely. And off these birds, um, Jack Fisher suggested appearing at, one, uh, at the Cleethorpe show. We bred the best novice at the World Show. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you, you, you mentioned light green. Now, that's interesting because mm. when I put your name into Google, it's not, <clears throat> it's not, it doesn't take long before I hear about Chris Snell, the light green man. Yes. <laughs> well, my me, me email address is lightgreenman at hotmail.com. Um, we... It's interesting, the light greens, that's the original colour. And it's this strange. It is probably the most difficult colour to, to produce in quality, in, in quantity as well. Mm. And we was told early on that oh, you, we won with a light green cock and it got best beginner breed at the York, big Yorkshire show in Leeds, at the Corn Exchange in Leeds. And somebody said to me, oh, you're lucky. You've been lucky with that green. And I thought, lucky? Well, we'll show them people and we concentrated on the light greens and eventually we got best in show with a baby light green hen at the world club show in Doncaster in 1984 happiest day of my life really I hope my wife isn't listening to this <laughs> <laughs> what, what, why are they so hard what makes you know what makes a light green so hard why, why is it different that's very interesting that because a light green um, can be split for blue it's a visual green green is dominant over blue so it has two genes you'll have a green gene and a blue gene so if you put green to green you can breed blues but we we had when my father was alive we we did have a, a stud of 100 percent light greens so they had two genes of green so we were breeding greens but as soon as you introduced another color into them to improve the quality, yes. then you can easily lose them. Believe you me, you can. <laughs> do, you, do you? It strikes me that in those certainly in those early days, mm. you, you, your father was uh, instrumental in you. Oh, a huge! Yeah. I mean, I was started at ten. I was enthusiastic, and I would go in to feed the beards twice as much as they needed of the good quality seed from Hayes, <laughs> which they get. <laughs> and uh, I would change the water twice a day. Dad said, yeah, you only can do it once a day, but I did it twice a day. I would, I was, I was um, obsessed with them. And, but I was only a young teenager. No, not even a teenager early on. So what, what were your friends doing at that time? So you're, you're a teenager. This is 1960s. In the yeah, 60s. Mid 60s. Mid 60s. So, you know, yeah. there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk of football. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, yeah. and, and those uh, the build up to, and you were you were in in the in the bird room really. Yeah, what? I was I was I, I must admit I was quite a good footballer when I was about ten or eleven. I was as good as anybody around, and I did go on some football trips with a, a, a with Grinsby to I went to Jersey, Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland, in in North Devon, on budge on oh, budget trips on on football trips, mm. but I gradually. Uh, because the birds were more important, I gradually um, trained so much and I didn't really try so much because all my efforts were going into me butchery guys. And I did actually uh, play a good standard of football. And when I got to 18, I started again and I played some really good matches and some high quality uh, matches and teams. But they were interfering with me butchery guys. Right. So that had to go. I can only, I can only do one thing at a time concentrate that's interesting because w w when i've we, we've met a few times mm. and i often think to myself you know what what makes a champion <laughs> budgie regard breeder what makes a champion mm. and, and and one of the first things mm. you know i think of is, is somebody who dedicates time and mm. passion so you gave one passion up in order to focus yes yes 100 percent. yeah if, if i was doing and say if i was playing golf now i would only be doing probably 75 percent birds and 25 percent golf 
Um, I just can't do that. I've got to do even it. now. No, no. no, even now I'm retired. I still I spend no day in my bed shed. I think a few hours. My wife would say it's a few days at a time, you know. So, but it, you 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 just got to concentrate. You only get out what you put in. Mm. I think that's the same with all walks of life, whether it's marriage or your work or your hobby. You got to give it hundred percent. Did you? Did you? Um, w- when did that dawn on you that you'd made that decision? Uh, was it? Was it a? You know, a, was it a decision that you made? You know, there and then I'm I'm going to stop football, or did football just start drifting away gradually? It started drifting away. Yeah, it started drifting away when I was eleven. Yes. Yeah. So it's, I've just been. I can't imagine life without some birds in the garden. <laughs> That's Budgie with the house. By yeah. The way. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what, what was the turning point? I'm interested in that. So at this point, it's still it's still a hobby. You know, you're you're, you're taking it, um, starting to take it serious you're under the watchful mm. eye of your father and, mm. and, and he's sharing his advice and, uh, and it sounds to me you you know you're all in really you've said well less football more more with the budget regards but what was the tipping point that made you think you know this th- I, this is more than a, a hobby it's... well i've already mentioned that what the tipping point was my rosette and i was junior 1966 at the, was at, the it? at that first rosette i won i just i still got it yeah <laughs> Really? I still got it, yes. You felt I can do this. I felt achieve- it was an achievement for an 11 year old or 10 year old then to mm. win a rosette. And even though it, the competition wasn't brilliant, but I didn't know that. And that's really pushed me on. And, yeah. and, and to win, then go to a bigger shows and start winning some shows. And uh, the thrill of it was unbelievable. Yeah. And, and still is. <laughs> so you still remember that? I still remember it, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, how do you? What do you do from there? Because that—that's mm. you know, you've reached the pinnacle, and you're and you're so young as well. Yes. So where do you go next? I mean, it's, well, that, it's like it, having I, a hit I, record. I realised um, that you know, that this show, the first show we showed at, was only a small show. There was mm. probably seventy birds there. Then the the Cleethorpe show is is the Memorial Hall in Cleethorpes. Uh, there was up to nine hundred birds there, and then very soon we was winning our section because there was there was four sections beginner novice intermediate and champion and you have sort of two years as beginner three years as novice four years intermediate then you become a champion and through the sections we started to win the locals the the section winners and we got to novice intermediate and we're starting to get best in show and best young bird in show and then uh, that was thinking well if we can do it here you know we, we always wanted to strive to the, the, the big shows. Uh, and the next big show was the Area Society shows in Yorkshire and in Lincolnshire. And we won them. And then we went to the, the World Show, which then was in Leicester in the, the early days. Then it went to Leeds. Now it's in Doncaster. And we started to win the major specials in our sections, through our sections. Um, <clears throat> and after... 19 years of keeping birds we got best in show at the world show with my light green hen november the 3rd 1984 one of the happiest days of my life <laughs> that's amazing isn't it mm. it's amazing stuff. yeah and we you know and it was in the hobby i've done so many things i got to thank the hobby to be in the budget society uh the uk one it's about two thousand members uh, I am president, as you mentioned, of the Bush Society. It's a great honour. I am president for two years. Uh, I've been a member since 1966, so about 50-odd years, a long time. And But we've had s- early days with my father. I can remember we, we, we were sat on a plane at Gatwick Airport and was going to San Diego in California to do a, le- a lecture at the American Federation of Aviculture, which was 1981. My dad looked at me and he says, what on earth are we doing here? <laughs> why, why, the, why are we going to talk about budgery guys in California? And he, and he looks at me, he said, son, you can do anything you want in the future. The world's your oyster. And, and basically from then, uh, I've been all around the world, all over the world. In fact, in what today's date is September the 27th, 
3rd of November, I'm going to Pakistan. I've been got my visa coming, and I'm judging the show out there. Yeah. And this is my third visit to Pakistan. So th- th- this is this is more than a hobby, isn't it? Then it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of life. It is. Yes, yes. And I've been to America three or four times, mm. South Africa, Romania, uh, Pakistan. I mentioned South Africa, and Romania, everywhere in Europe as well. Yeah. Scandinavia. Not many times. And and uh, what do, what do people want to know? So you're invited to <coughs> Pakistan, wherever. What do they want to know from knowledge, you? knowledge, right? Experience, um, particularly in in Asia, this is the hobby out there is new, <clears throat> and to be quite honest, the the future of the hobby is out there because they are so young. It reminds me when I started in the sixties. There's so many young people there. I'm twenty years older than the oldest person out there when I go. And they're like a sponge. They, they got, they got nobody in Pakistan with more than ten years' experience. And believe you me, ten years' experience is not a lot of time. If I can remember my ten years, my first ten years, I thought I knew it all. I didn't. I right. only knew a, a fraction of what I know now. Yeah. So I would go out there and tell them my experiences, how to feed them, how to look after them, everything to do with the hobby, and how to run the club. So. It's it's quite enlightening. Yeah, and it's obviously important to you that that, that knowledge is shared. Yes, is, yes. Is longevity important to you? Oh yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm on the general council of the Budget Society, and one of my is to spread the word the word worldwide. Mm. Um, it's important. That's important to keep the hobby going in the world because the the hobby is all around the world. But you know, unfortunately, in the uh, the richest countries of the world, Americas, Europe, uh, the hobby is declining because of the age of the people. I, I often say that, you know, when I was 11, a young teenager or a teenager, in my bedroom, I had a light and a, and a clock. That was it. Now, my son's bedroom is left home now. He had so many things in there, I didn't know what they were. <laughs> and he never used to come out of his bedroom. And he, I find him now, the younger people seem to stop in the bedroom with all this fancy equipment, as we've got here, you know, all this equipment here. You know, there's mm. nothing like this when I was young. And the social media, and there's so many things to do for younger people other than a hobby. Because a lot of people uh, would have budgies in the back garden. Right. Uh, people used to keep birds, they keep rabbits, mice, dogs, cats reptiles but now they've got so much more to do if so how easy would it be then i mean when when, when, when my family was young we had a we had a joey and a and josephine we we, we had yeah, we budgets did. we did <laughs> we had a brandy <laughs> <laughs> and we, we used to put them to sleep at night type yeah. of thing you know yeah, put, put a cover, cover, over. cover yes. over and that yes. was it um and and they were part of my childhood and i remember they were part of my friends as well yeah but i suppose if i can't remember many going to many houses though uh, now and 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 seeing budgies being kept so how easy uh, you know from a companion bird perspective would it be for somebody just to own a budgie or you know? it's it's um very good for somebody living on their own right um i know i've let some of my relations have birds and there's one called sydney because he's an Australian dominant pied, so they called it Sydney, because Sydney's in Australia. Yeah. And this bird talks, and the it's Janice, she's got this bird, and she's early 70s, I think. I hope you listen to this, Janice, and, you, and you're not late 60s, I have to apologise. And this bird just talks and talks and talks. It's unbelievable. Really? And I've let somebody else have, I let me, my oldest brother, who's in his mid-70s, I know, he's, I know his birthday, so I know he's like, he is mid-70s. And I let him have two birds, and they think the world of them. I let somebody else have two birds, you know, and I'm going to give a bird somebody in Fulstow where I live, another one. Yes. So I give a few away, and I say, and it's, it's, it's company as well. I think when you're living on your own, I've never lived on my own, but it'd be nice to have some company, like a pet or a dog, but a budgie is... No, it's quite easy to keep as well. Mm-hmm. Do you think a, a, a budget? Um, do you have one budget? Do you have two? Must you have more? Or, or, or I, I think it's, I, I, 
Difficult one. Um, most people only have one. If you have one, you've got a better chance of it being talking to you because all they're doing is copying. Now, if, if you was German, they would speak German. If you was French, they would speak French. So they only copy what you do. And they will sometimes copy the telephone. So, um, so but the beard will, will sound exactly the same. It will sound like the person who owns it. So if they have a little, say, good morning, Sydney, it will go, good morning, Sydney. You know, it will talk like the owner. Fascinating. Yeah. And, and, and so if, if I was on my own and, and, and I wasn't lucky enough to have family mm, and, and mm. so on, or I chose that, then mm. a budgie would make a, a good Big, companion. Yes, a good companion. Yes. And, and, and what about, are they easy to keep? You know, yes, do I have to, yes. Yeah. No, they're easy to keep. They're easy. You can put enough seed in for a week. And they've got the dishes there. Change the water daily. Put a cover on overnight. So it doesn't want to be in direct sunlight and it doesn't want to be in a draft. So we were doing, when I think back to when I was probably about six or seven, we mm. were doing the right thing, yes. putting the cover, the cover over at night. night. Yes. <laughs> I've often thought about that. Well, it's a bit like, like us, you know, you go to bed at night, you switch the light off, don't you? <laughs> you put the covers over you. Well, that's interesting because, you know, I, I've often thought when, when uh, how much of a role does daylight play uh, for, for bird breathers? Well, it, <clears throat> that's a very, very good question. Very good question. Uh, uh, most breeders will put the lights, they have automatic lights to come on at say seven in the morning and they'll go off at say 10, 30, 11 at night. I don't think that's a good idea because how would you like to live in a room with fluorescent lights or lighting all day? I think it's not right. Mm -hmm. um, so what I do, um, <clears throat> I do that over the winter months because I, I have to go in a lot and they'll be breeding through the winter but the best time for them to breed is in the spring like the wild birds that's, that's when they naturally become um, fertile um, they can be fertile in the winter but they're a lot more fertile in the spring and summer so what I do in the summer I switch my lights off so they'll, <clears throat> they'll wake up uh, when the sun comes up and they go to sleep when the sun goes down so that's nature so for six months of the year i've no lights on i have a night light on in case they get night fright so he, they can kill themselves if, if it's completely dark and something spooks them they fly all over and they can die so a night light yeah. and you've, you've got me thinking really when we say nature and i <coughs> think of people who go out and observe <coughs> nature in their own gardens <coughs> or in wildlife yeah. areas and so on observation comes to mind yes. yeah is it important that, you know to be observant in the bird room oh then? absolutely absolutely you've got to the more time you spend in the bird room i think the more time you save you playing golf you practice practice makes you better mm. you know um so yeah it, i spend a lot of time and i i have this sense of my birds i can tell when something is i can go into my bed shed in the morning I always say good morning to them. I have a quick look around, make sure the cage door hasn't opened, the bears are flying all over. Although I do have a safety door on. And I can go in there and I can sense something is wrong. I, 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 I can't explain it, but I can go and I can see, I think, that cage, there's something wrong in that cage. The, the cock bird's sat outside and he shouldn't, you know, he's normally, in, normally the other side. I can go in, the hen may have died or some chicks may have died or something has happened. But you, you, you somehow instinct. You can't I can't say how or no, but no. you instinctively know. No, I just instinctively. Right. Yeah, I can go in. And I think. I think it's the whole the, the the stud of birds, when they're all healthy and happy, the noise is deafening, which is brilliant. That's what you need. So I go in there, and they look at me, and it's as if they're telling me something. Yeah, I can't explain it. I think it's very strange, but I can go into a bird shed. And I can do it in anybody's bird shed. I can go into somebody else's bird shed and I'll say, you've got a problem in here. And it might be a big problem. Yes. And I, I've got a good sense of smell and I can smell disease as well. Well, yeah. that's fascinating. Yeah. Well, well, uh, when did you first realise that? How, how did that I, I don't know. I just, it's something just, <clears throat> I think it's the love of the birds and it sort of made me, it, it probably I was born with it. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I can just sense. And, I, and some people will say to me, 
I'm having problems breeding my birds as I've got a few too many dying. We come round <clears throat> and I can go round and have a look. And I'll go, first of all, it's the noise that gives it away. I said, it's too quiet in here. Is it normally it's quiet? It's quiet all the time. Well, you've got a major problem. And then, then we then we sort of tick off what it could be, and, and it, it could be mites. You know, the red mite could be sucking the blood out of them at night, and the mites disappear. Uh, and then the daytime, the, you know, they've had the blood sucked out of them. That, that sounds a bit... Yes. It, it, I've never known a, a, a lot of bears dying through red mites, mm. but it can make them a bit off. Yes, yeah. It's a thing to look out for. And, the, yeah. and that's <clears> interesting. <throat> I, I think... I think if I was listening to this, I'd be thinking, I want, I'm, I'd be leaning forward now in, into mm. the speaker and mm. thinking, come on, Chris, tell me what things I need to be looking out for. Well, Ooh. it's and it's the bears, a healthy bear sleeps on one leg. Bears sleep on one leg. So if you find a bird, even during the day, you know, if they're resting, if it's on two legs, its feathers, are, the feathers should be tight. But if it's, if it's fluffed out a bit, that means the bed's trying to keep warm. It's a bit like us when we're ill. We put a cover over us, don't we? And right. we have sniffles and we, and we don't really talk much. But it's the same with the beds. That's interesting. At the moment, I've got a little bit of a cold. And, mm. and I do feel exactly as you, yes, you, as do. you just and said. It's the same with the beds. You know? yeah, yeah. And, you, and also, uh, I caught up a bed this morning. It's a young hen, a really nice hen. I was thinking I'll be pairing up in the springtime. I looked at her and I thought, you don't look right. And she looked a bit, and she was not flying off well when she should do. So I caught her up. I checked a vent. And, and this sounds a bit rotten, horrible, but I smell the vent. Mm. Yeah, and she, if she's got um, even a touch of diarrhea or a touch of illness, normally you can smell it on the vent. So I went, no, that's fine. But still, some, so I smelled her nostrils. Candidiasis, so she had some medicine. But most people wouldn't have even looked now because I know, I know all my birds. Yes, that's not quite right. And 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 if you didn't do that and you didn't administer the medicine, yeah. the bird would die. The high possibility, yes. Mm. Yeah, mm. that's through experience as well. Mm. And that's the thing, isn't it? These birds are completely in your, mm. you know, you are completely in your care. They're Absolutely. completely reliant yes. on you mm. for all those things you've mentioned. Mm. And I guess, you know, obviously we're at Birdford Company, but they're completely reliant on you for diet. And, and obviously this is a, a loaded question, but it's, a, it's an important <laughs> question to address in terms of diet. You know, how important is, oh, oh, it's, is diet? It's 100%. Yeah. Looking after them, cleaning them, which everybody should do. Unfortunately, that everybody don't do, mm. but you, know, you clean them, uh, give them, uh, clean the perches, clean the cages, and um, but it's what you feed them, right? It's what you feed them. It's the same as us, you know. If you, uh, I've got people that I say, why don't you buy the seed I buy? Oh, it's too expensive. Why is it too expensive? Well, I can get some off Scunthorpe Market at half price, you know, and. It's a bit dirty, a bit dusty. And I go and look at the birds and I'm thinking, I can see why you, you see it's half price because half your birds are dying. So you've, you've got to look, you've got to feed the best seed available. You've got to. Um, and I know I'm talking now to the director of Hayes, but a few years ago, <clears throat> I went to Germany and bought my seed from Germany from an organic farmer, a budgie breeder because it was the best seed I've ever had. Because it was organic, and he did organic red sprays, he did everything was organic, canary seed, millets, mm. Japanese millet, the mohair millets, you know, different millets, and the beds really looked only a few percent better, but that's a big difference, mm. you know. Mm. They just look good. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, they don't do it now, And uh, but you know, I know I'm sat here with you, but you, you've still got the best seed in the UK. Because you clean it and you do your job right. Um, Dad always said that. Now, when he's gone, he said, always buy the best seed available. Mm. Hence why I went to Germany. Cost more money, but it was worth it in the end. But always buy the best seed available. And now I, I, I see all the people's seed and I wouldn't feed that to my birds. So simply by feeding seed, 
We all do the same. But if you give them something clean and better, you know, I've got an advantage over everybody. Yeah. What would you say if I brought our manufacturing team in, we mm. spend hours and hours and hours making sure our, our seed is super clean? You know, our, mm. our veterinary mm. advisors say to us that, you know, a seed that hasn't been clean um, has dust. Oh. That dust can, uh, can, can do damage to a bird's <clears throat> respiratory system. Mm. And, and so we clean and clean and clean and clean. And obviously, you know, sometimes we say, no, that's not quite clean mm. enough. Yeah. Clean it again, yeah. and 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 that's what we do. Uh, it's they're not wasting their time. I think is what you say. Absolutely <laughs> not. No, um, I, uh, many years ago, it might be forty years ago, when he was in Park Street, me and my dad went to see, and it was Walt Haith, which I think is a relation of Ted. It was a cousin of Ted Haith, and um, and he showed us what they was doing, and I was amazed how much dirt come out in the first clean. Yeah. I mean, there's big boulders of clay in it, you know, so you was paying for that as well. Yeah. And then they kept cleaning it clean. And I said, I said, oh, that's clean now. I know, no, another three cleans. And there was just, you know, every time there was a clean, the next clean was half half as much again. So, yeah, all right, you can never get it down, but it's like 0.001 or something of, of dust in it on dirt. Uh, and also, you see it's got that gloss on it as well yeah we're, we're seeing um you know because it's dry mm. and there's there's been less moisture mm. Mm. around when when seeds been harvested during that grain harvesting process mm. and we'll probably have noticed it or many people have noticed mm. it this year when they're driving past combine harvesters just oh, how much dust yeah the dryness have yes. you noticed it and it's going for miles you can see it on the mm. yes. horizon and so on so obviously we're, we're seeing seed that's arriving here even dustier than it's yes. ever been before yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're working um, you know, extra hard to try and mm. remove that, mm. and 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 it's it's good to hear. You. Now, what's interesting is if if I was sat, I don't know, if I was sat with a with a with a with any champion, I would, a part of me, would expect them to not reveal all their secrets, but I, I've got a feeling you do reveal your secrets in terms of yeah. what you feed, mm. when you feed mm. it, and so on. Is mm. that is that? Yeah, I just I, everything I do, I tell everybody. No, I have no secrets. I have no secrets. So there has to be more. There has to be more to keeping and, and being successful, a mm. successful bird breeder and keeper. Well, I think just... I've gone through it. You got to be dedicated. You give it hundred percent. The more you, the more you put in, the more you get out. Every, it's it's like um, my I run my bear Dave as if it's a business. No, uh, and I'm. Um, You'll get normal companies. You'll get directors. You get um, assistant directors and managers and the laborers and and I'm all of them. <laughs> I'm the yeah. finance director. I'm the sales director. Yeah. Uh, I'm a production director. So I look at it like that. And if I if I think mm, I'm not doing this quite right, then I I try to improve on it. You know, where in normally I stack the gear I was doing it and get somebody else in. <laughs> So and, and you're always putting bird the the health of the bird first. Yeah, they're so so important. You, you you once said to me that a bird's got to fly, and it seems yes. an obvious thing, but it's I not. I know is it, it it really is an obvious saying. Every budgery guy should fly. Why why it, to, to me it seems obvious. We, we we've created some monsters, um, and these bears can't fly. Now, the the, the bears like people keep bears like that. Uh, the, the the future of the hobby is at risk with those birds because if they don't fly there's something wrong with them and if they was in the wild uh, they wouldn't reproduce because the, the the rats and the everything else would eat them yes that's yeah. nature so you've got to have fit and healthy and obviously any animal in the wild they survive because the healthiest ones breed and the unhealthy ones don't and you've got to, and that's what I try to do with my my birds. Uh, I keep, I try to keep them healthy, and all of them. So some are more healthy than others, and probably if, if the bear's not quite right, I wait till it becomes right. Some don't. I do get deaths, of course I do, but you know a budgie's life, or an exhibition bear's life is four or five years, and you know I, I breed in three hundred a year. So yeah, so. The future of the hobby is at stake, and that's 
from my presidential two years, I've got two years of being president, that's one thing I mentioned about the well-being of the birds. For example, this year, a show in Southampton, the South Hampshire Fudgy Society, they cancelled their show in the middle of that heat in July. And people were complaining. And I said, that's the best thing you could have done. First of all, they said the, the people running it who in the 70s and 80s, and it was too hot, and the, the, bird, the bird venue is a lot of glass in it, and they put the bird's well-being before everything else. So that's always, that's got... That's, and I, congrat I, I yeah. sent them a message congratulating them. Yeah. You know, I don't want to see shows being cancelled, but um, where I live in Fulstow in Lincolnshire, we're only 20 minutes away where the, the record 40.3 temperature was at uh, Clonsby, mm. at the RAF base there. And, and that day... It was so hot, it was unbelievable. And I was in my bed, Avery, spraying them with cold water, just trying to cool them down. And I didn't lose any. But if I was away that day, I could have lost I could have lost them all. Yeah. I could have lost 10 or 20 or 50 or 100, I don't know. All, all because you sprayed. You, you, Spray, I just cooled them down. Yeah. But I saved I saved the lives of those birds. Is that, is that, that what everybody would do in a bird room? Is it yes, a common knowledge? Yes, yeah, a lot of people knowledge. would do that. But some people would be working. And I know somebody lost some birds. Mm. Uh, but it was 40 degrees. Really? Where, where I live. 40 degrees. And it, I was gasping for air. We're not... Us British people are not used to temperatures mm. like that. So... So even that companion bird that we talked about with one bird <clears> in a kitchen, yeah. you know, it still it still could be you know mid thirties, late thirties, yes, yeah. probably still a, a spray, just a mist, a, a spray. bit of bit of cold water to keep and keep it out of the sun, definitely. And even probably put a cover over it you now because a lot of houses are now insulated. So mm. my house was is so well insulated, it was only thirty degrees in my house, but forty outside. Yes, I didn't go outside much. Only so, well in the beach, and I was gasping for air myself yeah. and I've got ventilation in my bed shed but I was bringing in hot air <laughs> are, there, are there any um, are there any secrets that, that, or, or not necessarily secrets or what, what are the things that people don't do forget to do I mean when, when I think of the things that you feed you, you, you don't just feed seed do you? You, you you present you make your own soft foods for example I make my own soft foods yes um it's something which, when I, when we started, the, we used to feed him soaked oats, Scottish clipped oats, from Ted Ace, and we used to soak them overnight, 24 hours, put a bit of the vanadine in, and then feed them. Uh, they love soaked oats. And we and we used to, do, and I still do, do bread and milk. Really? You get a cube of bread and put some cow's milk over it. And they used to eat that. That was our soft food. That's before people used the present soft food. And, and what are we using the soft foods for? What, what, what's it's, their role? In well, it's a very good question that because in Aust my Australian friends think I'm crazy. Think Europeans are crazy feeding soft food because he said a budgerigar is a seed eater. That's the main diet is seed, and they will, uh, they will eat any. They'll eat insects. They'll eat anything in the wild. But. I just go but first of all me my my um, bread and milk I still feed. I use Hovis brown bread into crumbs and I use soya powder milk and I put with water. I don't use any milk. I use soya. So it's no no because cow's milk uh is got a lot of lactose in it and it prevents the cock bears from producing sperm. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? I would that's why my father and I changed 40 years ago to soya. And be quite honest, 40 years ago, we didn't know what soya was. <laughs> <laughs> so you were, you were early adopters. Yeah, yeah. So we're buying... Soya. <laughs> we go into, uh, I go into Tesco now and I'll, I'll buy five tins of soya milk. And I say, what's that for this for? I say, it's from, from your budgie regards. And honestly, they look at me gone out. They think I'm crazy, you know. And I put honey in it. And I might put a bit of, a bit of, a bit of vitamin B12 in for fertility, only a little bit. And I pour that over the, and it's like a porridge, and I feed that in finger drawers. And now my soft food, I I use. Um, you can buy, uh, you probably sell some soft food, uh, uh, egg based and things like that. Uh, it's too expensive for me. I'm a, I'm a northerner. I like a bit of cheap stuff. So mm. I, I 
I use, um, as I make my own base, I use couscous, I use porridge oats, and I use wheat germ bran, and I um, frosties, I put them in the blender to make them into a, a small, small frosties. That's my base, and I will then get an orange, the juice of an orange, a lemon, and a lime goes into that dry, dry, so that they're getting an orange, a lemon, and a lime. That's my base, and then uh, in the winter months, I will put I will uh, three eggs, three chicken eggs, and I will either boil them. I I now put them into a pan and into like uh, scrambled egg, so it's dry. I put that into the mixture, and I buy organic carrots, Tesco or Aldi sell them about a pound a pack. Fennel bulb, apple. Uh, I grow spinach and chard in the garden. I put mint in and rosemary. Did I say apple? Your birds have got a better diet than me. Yes, that's they... what's coming across <clears> here. <throat> so, how many of the diet? How <clears throat> much is as a percentage? How much is seed playing as a percentage <coughs> of that total? Oh, the seeds playing eighty um, percent. Right. Yeah. So, so you must have. A... So the seed is the most important thing. Right. And this is a, a supplement. This is yeah. So this is, yeah. Okay. So th so this is this is bringing out some of that 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 nature within the birds, yes. which your yeah. colleagues in yes. Australia it, and so it, on. Yes. Are talking it, about. The wild budget would eat anything. Yeah. You know. Um. I I grow, I grow uh, eucalyptus in the garden because the eucalyptus or the gum trees in Australia that's where the budgery gars nest in. Really. So, yes. So that's the actual. Um. I, I was once approached about importing uh, eucalyptus leaves until I realized there's even loads of the eucalyptus trees in this country <laughs> <laughs> so yes I give eucalyptus branches uh, they love them so, and, so and eucalyptus branches when they chew them it deters red mite as well red mite don't like it so so the daft question you know perhaps eucalyptus grows as we know really yeah. really fast yes could I in my garden plant a couple of eucalyptus trees yes. and forage from yes yeah yeah yeah, and apple trees, pear trees, plum trees. Live from nature. From nature, so. yeah. And you can give willow, hazel. So all these things, they'll go into the aviaries at different times. So 80% good, clean seed diet. And yeah. these other things are the things that make you a champion. Yeah, yeah. you could say. <laughs> as well. But no, it's the 80%. I would No, I would say the, it's the 80% of the clean seed is is the most important bit oh interesting because that's 80 percent the other 20 percent um different breeders and exhibition breeders they have they they do vary they're completely different to me i'm not saying they're right or i just mm. like some people put garlic in oh i hate garlic i detest garlic so i don't give them a bit i only give things what i like <laughs> i sometimes uh, put a bit of beetroot in that's good for the for cancer oh, do you make your own do, do you buy a seed mix or do you do you make your own well i buy the seed from you as you know and yeah. i my any diet for uh, a budgery gas should be 50 percent canary seed it's a little bit higher protein than the millets so um i use 50 percent canary i have white millet red millet pannikin millet jack millet and then uh then your budget tonic seed and that is, they're getting a, probably everything you sell in that mixture. What does that tonic do for them? What, what's, where does, how does it's, that work? It's, it's a little bit more, it's not, it's an, it's an oily, more oily because Japanese millet and linseed in it and niger. Mm. And that just gives them a little bit more shine onto the, onto the feathers and a bit of oil into the system, you know. Right. But if you just fed them tonic seed, which they love, they go fat. <laughs> ah. Because of the oil. Because of the oil. Yeah. So again, balanced diet. And um, um, balance, variety. Yeah. Freshness. Yes. Yes. Clean. Yeah. And all it, keywords, and, aren't they? Yeah. And then I give them a lot of green food. I grow chickweed in the garden. I go looking for chickweed in people's gardens. <laughs> I was once shot at <laughs> when I was living in Holtney Clay forty years ago. There was a a, a big a nursery there. It was just full of chickweed. So I went into this nursery 
and uh, I was at the bucket, right at the back, collecting this chick with a big black bag, and this chap shouts at me. I've turned up, and he shot the gun in the air. My head, boy, I did half move quick. <laughs> <laughs> But I feed them a lot of chickweed, seeding grasses, spinach, chard, carrots. Yeah. So. And, and is, does grit, grit? Oh, yeah. grit is, yeah. It's interesting that. At the weekend, I was talking to a guy who's never fed grit in his life. Uh, we had a, not a heated discussion, but I just told him he was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> because grit is, is like humans' teeth. Now, if we never had any teeth, we would still survive. And we'd have to mush our food up with no teeth, which would be difficult and take a long time. And it would affect the human being's digestive system over the, over the years. Same with grit. If the bird has got no access to any grit, um, the grit goes into the gizzard and, and grinds the seed. Simple as that. It's, it's, a lot of birds ha must have grit. That's why you see sparrows picking on roads, picking mm. bits up. Yeah, the mortar, you see it, you know, yeah. in the mortar yeah. between bricks. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. And, and you, so grit is vitally important. Um, I do feed cuttlefish, not as much as they used to, because you can get a, a calcium supplement you can put into you. But I don't like, I'd rather give them it natural than something out of a bottle. Because mm. so many companies say, you know, so many milliliters to a pint or to a, to a liter. I sometimes think they're trying to sell it. I, I usually give half what they recommend. So look for a natural solution. Natural, if it's all there. the time, natural. Like chickweed. Oh, yeah. I, I, one, I, you said to me earlier, what's one of your main differences? I think chickweed. Yeah. Green food, chickweed. They, apt, you can see, they go mad for it. They love chickweed. Uh, fresh chickweed. Um, people say, oh, my bears don't like it. Well, if I went to Asia and they gave me some curry or something, I've never had curry in my life, I wouldn't like it. But if I stopped there for a year, I probably would like it. So it's something. So if you want to, if you haven't given chickweed, just give them a very little bit until they get used to it. And they will be absolutely, they, they look completely different. They love it. They get excited. Really? <laughs> yeah. And that is a huge difference to what anybody else does. People say, oh, no, I can't be bothered with chickweed. I'm frightened that it might be contaminated. Now, chickweed, yeah, it's like if, if you put weed killer on chickweed, because chickweed is full of water, natural water. You can't get anything better. It's, and it's full of water. So if you put any weed killer on it, within an hour, it starts to shrink and go mm. curl up. Now, if you put it on grass, it will take three days because it's a different texture. So, and if I'm not too sure, I taste it. <laughs> Yeah. I was told by a farmer, he said, no, when I spray my fields, chickweed goes straight away. Hmm. So let's, for example, I'm going to a field and he sprayed it and I'm there half an hour later. Uh, even then, he said, you should be able to tell. So every time I, I go to a spot where I know it could be, might have sprayed it, I actually go and taste it. That's, that's interesting. And the, my farmer friend said, it, it would probably, if you wait a lot of it, it would probably make you sick, but it would probably kill your birds. Yes. So, but it's interesting what you say about about natural water, because you know many people who, who, who <clears throat> harvest rainwater. Mm, yeah. will, my my mother will say that her flowers will do oh, better yeah. with natural rainwater yeah, you, rather than tap water. Well, a garden, a keen gardener will have butts, water butts in the garden. Mm. We'll have water butts from the uh, from the rain. Now I, I'm very fortunate. I live in the countryside, and I live next to a farm. And Fulstow is an old village, and every old building has a, a well in the garden. That's how they used to get the water, and they've still got them. So my neighbour, he has pure water coming from the Lincolnshire Wolds. I've had it tested. It's pure as pure water. And I feed my birds that every day. And the, and the different... When I was uh, I building my house four years ago, I lived in a caravan, and, and I knew this water was there, but I used to give them tap water. And the birds were fine. Mm. But as soon as I gave them this fresh water, I've been having it for two and a half years now. The difference is unbelievable. It'd be the same with us. You, you drink some tap water, it's got a taste to it because it's already been through probably a dozen human beings yes. and they're putting stuff in it to, uh, to make it, well, 
killed the disease yeah processed isn't yeah it? processed yeah. yeah so and and also i have big inside aphids and large very large outside aphids exercise it's like, like people they go in and they have just cages and a small a little flight four foot where the bears can fly but only four foot they need to be flying 24 feet or yeah. you know, the more the better a, a bird's got to fly bears got to fly and if you get to hear no if you get to a young man who doesn't do any exercise he slouches you know a bit fat belly legs hurt now that same man exercise twice a day for a year muscles stands stands better mm. uh, no fat the difference is that you can just see it in humans mm. the difference is unbelievable so it's the same with my birds they all fly and they're all outside in the rain and they bath in the rain open tops the rain can come in now people say oh no you don't want to have open flights well, what about bear droppings wild bear droppings i get wild bear droppings in my aviary this time of year in september it's the black bears eating brambles blackberries and all the poo is purple mm. don't affect the birds what does affect the bears is a sick bird wild bird but you tell me when have you ever seen a sick wild bird they die mm. nature nature takes over yes they don't last the night yeah. uh, and something else will get them they'll fall on the floor it's something will eat it mm. so you you don't get you get a flock of birds you don't get any sick birds in them mm. they're, because they're flying and they're healthy <clears throat> so healthy droppings it's not ideal but it's, you know keeps them so they have the, all the rain when it rains they love it outside they go mad Chris, it's interesting that, you know, many things and we've looked back over this chat, you know, you talk about your dad, mm. and obviously very fondly. Mm. Um, what was he like? Arthur, my dad, yeah. Uh, people say to me, I look like him and act like him now, which I think, oh my God, I know, because he was, um, he would just, when he, he died 28 and a half, you know, in, in May 1994, so a long time ago. Uh, but obviously the influence of him is still there with me and uh, he, he, we would do talks together and he, and he would say things I'm thinking dad you can't say that why not I said well you know if he might offend somebody doesn't matter I'm exactly the same now <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm thinking now I'm his age I'm thinking well I can do what I want you know because I was, but I say it sincerely and he did as well so he was um um, well, he was born in 1924, my dad. Um, he was in the Second World War on an aircraft carrier. Uh, he was um, on the Russian convoys, um, taking up, uh, supporting the convoys to Archangel and Murmansk. Uh, he was in the Pacific, uh, based out of San Diego, and helping the Americans. Uh, protecting the fleet and the, the uh, when they did the islands when they was invading the islands, for, and his ship was hit by a kamikaze plane, and it hit the back of the ship. He was on an aircraft carrier, and the fuel tanks were there, and it blew up. And actually, he, I think it was that time he got, uh, with the explosion, he he got banged against the door, and a and a table, trapped him, and from then on he had a bad back. <laughs> And then uh, he was in. The, he went to um, uh, Hawaii, Pearl Harbor. He saw the sunken ships there. And then he was in the uh, at, in the Channel and D-Day, uh, supporting the the fleet uh, with the, with their planes. And he always told me, he said, "It was a week before we realised what we was doing." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was. So he brought up in the you know Second World War, and he became a joiner after the war. Um, uh, putting on roofs, first, first and second fixes in houses, uh, and he was, uh, you know, good guy, you know, good guy. Where, where did he find his passion for? The well, I said to you earlier, um, he he kept budgies with the eldest brother Brian when I was five, only pet birds, and I, and I looking back on it, he, he, he had that he had that way with livestock. Um, and he would sell them for pets, but they were always healthy. 
uh, even then he went to see to get the seed from Hayes. Oh. And so he, he I suppose I've, I've got that knack off him because he would, um, you know, he's straight talking, tell me off, which I didn't like sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was younger. And did he have an, did, was there somebody who inspired y your father? I think his father, yeah. yeah. Well, his father died when he was 17. Granddad Albert, he died in 1942. So I think he was inspired by his father, yeah. But uh, going to war when you're 17, 16, and finishing when you're 21, it's it, it's sort of hardened, hardened him to life, I think, you know. So that's for his father. Mm. Uh, and, and so I'm interested, I'm, uh, you, you've told me before about your, your earliest thought or your early encounters with uh, with Haith's. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, one of my earliest ones is nothing to do with budgies. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, me and my brother and a friend, Steve, would go and collect bulrushes. Now, bulrushes are, are, are like a, well, I don't know what it's like, it's uh, like a microphone, like this microphone I'm talking to uh, in a stem. And we would cut these bulrushes and near, near where I live now, tie them to our bikes and, and which used when we, we used to time so much so it was very difficult to steer the bike so it was very dangerous and then we would put them into five and sell them now i lived in new walton near grinsby and the main rich street and the rich road in grinsby and cleethorpes was humberston avenue where a certain mr ted haith lived and his lovely wife mrs haith so we would target the rich area and sell five bullrushes for half a crown, which is <laughs> two and six or 12 and a half pence now, is it? <laughs> and I can remember going to this nice bungalow with a double fronted bay windows. It was an enormous bungalow. And this lady came, she must have been, well, I was <clears throat> 11 or 12. So I imagine she, everybody was old then <laughs> to me. Jim Bash probably in the 50s or 60s. And I said, uh, do you want to buy any bullrushes, Mrs? <laughs> and she bought some off me and she bought two lots off me for five shillings. Five shillings to me was a fortune. And it went towards the budgies. But I didn't know it was Mrs. Haith until uh, many years later when, um, well, somebody said it's Mrs. Haith. I didn't really twig on mm. that it was the, you know, my seat supplier. <laughs> so when, when did you yeah when did you eventually tweet you know that, i think it was a f few years later yeah. when i told daddy and and i think my, my dad said well you ought to go down on mr avenue that's where the haiths live i said i think i've already done that dad <laughs> and, and and do you remember going to park street then which you know oh our, yes park street factory, oh yeah. yes even from the age of 10 when we first got there we used to go there on a saturday morning and the amount of people you would meet from all over the country the people used to travel Saturday morning to pick up the seed. And there's always that smell of the tonic seed, which is the other seed. And you go into the, and a few mice around as well, <laughs> always. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'd go into the, the back room and there was those, those, those women there, where that, that they were old to me, but they might not have been old. And they were so lovely and so, you know, they used to take me and, how you doing, he and Mr. Snell, and yes, and we used to buy our Ray Ring canary seed there. Oh, right. Ray yes, Ring. Yeah. Oh, well, Ray Ring ma the, Mazagan. Mazagan, the best canary seed ever. Moroccan. Yeah. Yeah, best canary seed ever. I mean, I've said to Rachel, can you get me any more? So we can now. But anyway, it was beautiful seed. And these were the, really the, hal would you say these are the, the halcyon days? Oh, yes, of yes. Of, bird keeping yes yeah. the 60s mm. when there was the budget society now has approximately 2,000 members 15,000 then in the 50s there was 25,000 so I'm told <laughs> so that's when and, and Hayes everybody used to go to Hayes so mm. it was uh, yeah it, it was good fun and we sometimes go into the office and dad was a good friend of uh, Ted and then his son um, Ray and they go in there and have a cup of tea and talk about things and 
I think quite boring actually when two old men were talking, but never mind. <laughs> I, I guess it, it probably boring at the time, but now you look back. Oh yes, it would have been fascinating. Uh, yes, and and yeah, yeah. You, it would have been fascinating. And we'll talk about the seed, and uh, I can remember Walt Haith. As I said, I think I mentioned him earlier. Did, yes. yeah, I think it was probably Ted's cousin, or I know they're related, and he was the foreman. And when some good, when the seed came in, when it was new seed, uh, he would ring me dad and say, Arthur, the new seed's in. Or if he went in when it's the old seed, if you wait two weeks, Arthur, come back, there'd be the fresh seed. Because the fresh seed is always better. So, so we used to get, you know, telephone calls from Walt. <laughs> yeah, and then I said here he took us around, and he showed me the really old, the really old machines then, uh, and put the work really well, uh, how they cleaned it and things, and that was fascinating. And mm. we had some Americans come over to see us, budgie breeders, and we took them on a tour around there. Funny enough, I saw a photograph recently of that. So I have to bring it into you. Yeah, yeah I look forward to it. You, mm. we, we've talked a lot. Well, we've talked mm. about the you know the the, the halcyon days, mm. and we've we've talked about where we are today, and mm. you were saying about growth, you know, Pakistan and so on, growth mm. and interest, mm. and mm. and and the age profile of people mm. who keep budgies. Mm. Where, where do you, what's what's your, um, I suppose, what what's what's your thoughts on on where where the hobby goes from here? A bit frightening, to tell you the truth. Um, uh, yesterday. Two days ago, I was at the World Club Show in Doncaster, and it was the, the best, probably the best show in the world. Uh, well run, oh, fantastically well organised, everything organised, experienced people. And I was talking to somebody there, and you know, and there was, I, I'm sixty-seven, and I was one of the one of the um, youngest there. Um, it's a problem with age, as I said earlier, about there's nobody, there is young people coming in, but not like it used to be when the everybody is, you got two young ones coming in, one old one going out. It's now one old one going out and another old one going out. Uh, it's just a natural procession of people leaving the hobby. And I said that uh, in 20 years time, 90% of the people there wouldn't be here in 20 years time. And where are we going to replace that 90%? It is a bit scary. A bit scary. But as I said, I, I tell everybody, the future of the hobby is in Asia. Right. Because the Middle East, Pakistan, China, India, Bangladesh, all these places, they are really, really keen on exhibition birds. Well, what do we lose? Uh, some, some people may listen to this podcast and say, well... You know, if if people don't keep birds any any more, you know that's fine. The birds can can be wild and free living. But what 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 do we lose? What's lost? Because it strikes me that w so many of those people at the budget regard Budger society are, are going to be, you know, equally committed mm. um, and and have so much knowledge. But once it's gone, mm. it's gone. So yes. you know, what do we lose? There's going to be just less people around. Just less people with the knowledge less birds around um, and the more people you've got and the more birds you've got the more competition you've got the better the birds will be uh, I, I'm a member of the General Council of the Budget Society and we are looking at everything we can do to encourage people and I, I, it's very very difficult as I said to you you know young people don't want to it's a culture thing, really, isn't it? No, no yeah. young people are in doing hobbies. Yeah, it's te technology, technology, artificial intelligence. We we use yeah. technology. I mean, budget, we're all on the computers, mm. Facebook, Instagram. So that's being used. But to get people going to meetings, keeping beds, it's extremely difficult. No, no, yeah. there is no. The hobby won't disappear, but it'll just get smaller and smaller. Um, now, in twenty years' time, I'll. Good God, I'll be 87, you know. I can still be keeping bits. Well, you, uh, the, 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 mm. that was my next question. Mm. You know, do, do you ever see there comes a time where you stop? Well, there's there's two ways I'll stop. If I drop down dead, I'll stop. <laughs> Obvious. And the other way is that I am get to the stage where I'm unable to look after them. So this is a job for life. It's not a yes. job, is it? No, really? it's, but this it's, is, it's for life. This is you for yeah. life. I will not get... I will not get 
I'm perfectly fit and healthy at the moment. Mm. I wouldn't sell all my... If somebody offered me a lot of money, I wouldn't sell my birds. Or if I did, I'd get some more. So I'll be keeping birds until I physically can. Um, but if I get to the stage where um, something I know I ain't got much longer to live, I would then probably sell them. Um, yes, it, it's... If I can't look after them, it's like when I was playing football, I wasn't put every effort into it. Mm. I can remember once I was playing football and I was 21 and I was centre half, captain of this team, and this long ball came over. Now I'm six foot and I could head the ball better than I could kick it. And this ball came over my head. I thought, oh God, I've missed that. And this lad, well, ran up past me and he, and he said something rather rude to me. He said, Snelly, blah, blah, blah. And he went and scored a goal. I thought, that's, that's, that's insane because I'm quick, but I lost my pace. And then it happened again. I tripped him up. <laughs> <laughs> and I got booked, but unfortunately the referee was a friend of my brother's. He never sent me off. But then I realised I'm not doing it right. So I stopped football, concentrate all on budgies. And if you're going to do something right, you've got to give it 100%. Do you think, you know, what you've learnt, and it strikes me that there is, the, the things that you've learnt keeping budgies seem um, transferable or transportable to many things in life, don't they? Yes. Really yes. about that commitment mm. and, and, and just stay in the course, really. <laughs> yes, I think with, with my, it, it helped me uh, when I started work, when I was, well, I was 15, nearly 16. Um, I went to work and because I'd been mixing with adults, and talking to them on on equal footing, so to speak, I started work, and it helped me on, on my job. Uh, I I was experienced with adults. Yes. Because in school, no, fifteen, you wet behind the ears. You know they could do anything. And yeah. but I was experienced. I could hold my own. And it did help me on my business. And 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 your, uh, from memory, you 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 were in the timber business. And yes, in the softwood and plywood business, and in purchasing, um, from Russia. In Scandinavia, Canada, and, and in Europe, uh, I was a purchasing director of companies, and we we had a company um, with an office in Saint Petersburg, so I'd go to Saint Petersburg in the nineties quite regular. That must have been fascinating, wasn't it? Scary, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Scary, scary, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Where I did deals with the Russian mafia, and it was looking back on it, oh, God, I, I shouldn't have done it because it was. People was was shot when I knew I, I I didn't see any shootings, but people I knew got killed. It was a it was horrendous country. Unfortunately, it's really gone bad now as well. So, so so, so you you when you were out there in St Petersburg, mm. then you come home yeah. to the to the budgets. <laughs> yes, to come home to the budgets. That was a relief. <laughs> I was in one piece. Yes, so huge. Yeah, you know contrast though, isn't it? Yes, really? yes, and it, I, I think the budgets kept me sane. <laughs> Uh, the, the the business I was in was um, after the the uh, war went down in Berlin in the early nineties. Uh, I first went there to Russia. Uh, my boss said, "I think you should go because you you pay, we purchased a lot of Russian timber and it's not not available now. Let's go and see where it is." So I went out there. I've never been scared in my life. They were, the Russian people were really scary. <laughs> and when I came back, I said to my boss. If you send me there again, I'm going to work in Tesco's. <laughs> Six weeks later, I arranged another visit because I realised potential out there. So I went out there with a company who had plenty of money, uh, cash rich, and I did deals with Russians, which was unbelievable. You know, made a lot of money for my business. So, uh, but, you know, the Russian people, generally they're okay. It's just the, the top people. You know, they're... Russia is completely different to anywhere else I've been to. You think they had communism for all those years and they couldn't make a decision for themselves. Then they get freedom and they still can't make a decision. They, they still have to be told. And they, they just, you, you got to you got to go there to understand them. So, at the moment it's gone back years, unfortunately. I've got lots of friends, Russian friends out there and who are, can't even talk to me now because they're, they're afraid of talking. There's the theme really of um, you know this is a world this is a world hobby. Mm. Uh, Pakistan are, are, are embracing mm. the hobby. Um, 
what can we do in the UK too? Although figures maybe decline in decline mm. in the UK, mm. we should still be pleased that there are other parts of the world that are... Yes, uh, we are, yeah. What yeah. we're doing in, 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 in this country, we've started the Budgerigar Club, yeah. which is for pet birds. Right. So we're trying to, you know, because the pet birds have been, uh, not even been mentioned in my lifetime in the Budget Society, which is nearly 60 years. So we've, we've started the Budgerigar Club to encourage pet breeders to get involved and, pet, and people have a pet mm. and they can find out because most people I know when I give them a pet budgie they have no idea how to look after it so now there's a there is something there to help people to understand if you want one budgie and, and other yeah. people want to have that information yeah one one thing you I think we were talking about we've, we've mentioned about um, how, how you feel better you know mm. in the company of yes, nature yes. wildlife birds yeah. and so on mm. There has never been, I don't know whether it's just that we talk about it more, but I would imagine the, the, the figures and statistics would say that our children um, uh, uh, have, n have never had to confront the problems that they've had to confront in terms of their anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, depression, mm -hmm. isolation through COVID, mm -hmm. lockdowns and the rest of it. Mm -hmm. It strikes me that one of the answers pr probably, you know, it's, it's not the it, complete answer, but, but one thing people could look at is, is keeping a pet. I mean, if... If if you have anxiety, keeping a budgie may may be one of the ways. Well, I, I'm sure it is. I think we mentioned forward. earlier. You know, mm. the people who lose their partner, uh, they have they need something to talk to in the morning and, and, and to to get involved. Yes. And and if and they seem and as you said before, you know, this relatively simple to 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 look after to keep. Yes, very easy. And you get a lot back from them as a well. A lot. Back. It's not a one way street, no, then, is it? A lot really? back. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's hopefully something that we we as Hayes, um should should probably do a little bit more. You know, mm. we 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 talk to a lot of people who know what they're doing, but also mm. we should we should try and make sure there's information for mm. for people who are either new or considering mm. um, keeping a, 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 mm. a budget and so on. So that's mm. something that I think we. Well, what we I'll do, do, I'll give you the information about the budget gear club. That would be great. Yes, we could do something there. Hopefully, yes. We appreciate that. So we we are trying to. Encourage people to keep budgies, um, even you no, know, because we might find somebody has one budgie and think, oh, I will get some more. And next thing you know, they'll be a member of our society and it starts to keep the exhibition birds. It's yeah. it, we're trying, believe you me, we're trying everything, but we're up against the modern, modern, modern world. Yeah, yeah. I think you've put a really good argument mm -hmm. together of why mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, perhaps I can, well, I can see why one, one other. Segment is, is 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 pigeons racing pigeons and so on, and we can see yeah. you know well, the, the decline in them is horrendous. Absolutely, yes. Uh, uh, somebody's told me locally there was used to be sort of twenty societies, and there's only one now or two. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, and, and and yet you know it, it could probably be the same argument that mm. you know keeping and and mm. looking after something mm. other than yourself mm. could make you feel better about. Yeah. Well, if, you, if you're, you're going to keep you know an avi full, you you can't. You know, you've got to think about when you go on holiday. <coughs> you've got a commitment. You've got to go in every day. Or, I mean, I, I, I was away this weekend, and I did go in. I went in Friday. I left Friday afternoon. I was in the beds all day Friday, made sure there's all okay. And I came back Sunday evening. So I was away. I was glad to get home to make sure the beds are okay. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Chris, you know, when we look back, you know, we, we, I guess we all would like to be you know, remembered for what we've done. You know, what would you say? We've already talked about one of your proudest moments, mm. really. What would you say is something that nobody knows about you that perhaps can inspire somebody to take this hobby up? What is it? What is it they're going to get that we've not talked about so far? Good question. I, I'm very open when I talk, so I think everything I've said, I think I've covered that. You know, there's no, there's nothing. I'm holding back. I've told you everything I know, and any of you know, if anybody's got any questions, contact me. Yeah, yeah. It strikes I'm, I'm me open. that being a champion, as, as I said, you, you've given away your secret formula. <laughs> it's no secret anymore. <clears throat> you know, you've you, you've you've explained what uh, you know what percentage, eighty percent of, <clears throat> of the diet <clears throat> is seed. <clears throat> you've told, uh, explained how you make your own soft foods. <clears throat> you've helped people understand what products or what, what vegetables mm. and, and so on they, that can be grown in their own uh, gardens to support mm. uh, their bird's mm. diet. You've mentioned the 
how important it is that seed is clean, healthy, and you've also explained some of the bird keeping craft, the craft. Of, mm. It's the craft, isn't mm. it, really, yeah. of bird keeping? Yes. Not just the feeding, mm. but the craft. Mm. And and so you've given away everything. Yeah, we, I've got no secrets, none at all. And the, that's the only one. The only I said earlier, the only thing I do different to most other people is green food. And I would say if one thing is different to anybody else, it's chickweed. Simple. And people sometimes say, "Well, I don't eat chickweed." But I now, if if somebody came to me and said, "You want to feed that product?" If I thought it could increase the uh, the health of my bird, I would do. I am constantly looking at different things all the time. And and that's another t- another mm. tip to being a champion, really. Yes. Constant review. Constant review. And sometimes uh, when things are not... I get the feeling in the aviary, things aren't just right here. So I, I usually sit down. Uh, I know my dad died a long time ago. I talk to him. Dad, what should I do? What did we used to do 40 years ago? And often, we used to do that. So I'll do that. <laughs> So I'm thinking you can get you can get blase about things that everything's right, but just go back what we used to do. Right, I'll do that. Or it might be a small thing, but it, very often a small thing can be the important thing. And sometimes you can you can be feeding something, uh, say oats, soaked oats. Well, that's just an example. And if you give them too much, they love it, and you're tempted to give them more than they need. And over three years, you could have created problems in your stud because they've had an excess of one food. So then you just, hang on, I'm giving too much of that. Cut it down by half. Then you see the bears get back to where they should be. So always, always looking to improve. Always. If you, if you sit back and think you've done it, are you finished? Okay. Chris, it's been a pleasure talking <coughs> to you. Thanks ever so much. And thanks for being a good friend of Hayes. And... Okay. Uh, Thank you for sharing everything you know uh, about keeping budgetary guards. Really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, Simon. Thank you.